Thank you very much, General, for that fascinating speech, really focusing on the importance of a coalition given the rules-based system is under attack and also the proliferation as well of, of commercial space activities. Really fascinating and I'm sure we're going to be diving more deeply into some of the themes um, with the questions that you've been uh, very kindly sending through. Um, so do keep them coming because we're going to take a, a few of them now. Uh, so let me join you. So first of all, we have um, a question uh, from Tim Robinson from Aerospace uh, Magazine for General Brown. Uh, General Brown, how will you take allies and partners with you as you accelerate change or lose what, for example, might be the minimum requirement for a US coalition partner in 2040? Probably the min minimum requirement is being willing to work with us. <laughs> um, and, and that's, and as I think about integrating with design, it's not so much that we set a standard and then have our allies and partners come to it. It's we meet them where they are and then we work together to move forward uh, for a collective security. And, and that, to me, starts with relationships. And uh, the, having those relationships and having a chance just to sit down and dialogue, um, and we can find some areas that we can agree on, and then how do we take those and build? OK, thank you very much. Um, and also, uh, General Raymond, one for you. How do we encourage and lead responsible behavior in space? And who is best placed to police it? I think the, the best way to do it is to uh, from, from my perspective, is to, is to demonstrate that good behavior each and every day by how we operate, and to do that in partner in with our allies and partners. And that's a, a lot of the work that we've been doing in Shriver War Games and and in the combined space operations uh, meetings that we have. We talk about that. We we act transparently. We we operate in a way that uh, would be recognized as safe and professional. Uh, and then I'm not naive enough to think that if we have all of this, um, that, it's going, that everybody's all of a sudden going to start following the rules. But it clearly will help us identify those that are running the red lights. And collectively, we'll be able to address that. Yeah, could I just add, add as well? Because um, and it, it's work that's uh, being led by the UK, but with a number of other partners in the United Nations around establishing what the United Nations view of acceptable behaviors and norms of behavior in space are. Because at the moment, there isn't. There isn't. You know, there isn't an agreed normal behavior. And that becomes a really important element of A, acting in accordance with that code, but then calling out and being very swift to call out those space users that are, that are, not, uh, that are not operating in, according, in accordance with what we would recognize as the norms of behavior. And, uh, and so that, that United Nations work, which is ongoing now, which I know many of the sort of nations represented here are are fully supporting is it a really important part that we can do as an international collective community to again to you know, to to address those those behaviours in space. Okay, thank you very much, uh, General Brown Jr. If you could take this question: Does the West have enough stocks of missiles, precision munitions to fight extended peer-on-peer -peer conflict, and is it time to boost stocks in your view? Well, I, I would say yeah, as a military member, you can never have enough. <laughs> yes, uh, exactly. <laughs> so. Uh, we and like then, some more I, think, I think the other part we got to think about that is as the threat advances, what we have today may not be the, the capabilities we have in the future. Uh, I also think it's not only what we do in the kinetic realm, but it's also what we do in the non-kinetic realm. And this is where cyber comes into play. This is where space comes into play. This is where information comes into play. And these are the things that we, uh, I think, collectively have to broaden our perspective of the tools that we have available. And you think about integrated by design and, and also the aspect of the uh, our, our new national defense strategy uh, within the United States that talks about integrated deterrence. It is to bring together all the capabilities uh, that we have. So it's not just about munitions, although it's great to have many of them that are very capable. Um, but I also look at uh, the balance between capability and capacity. Um, and we want to make sure we have the right capability with the right capacity and then bring all those tools together to be effective. Okay, thanks very much, uh, General Brown Jr. And um, I'd like to see, uh, Chef Marsh, if you can actually take this one and on as well. What's your view uh, in terms of this um, integration, really, uh, between, as you're saying, space um, and air power? It's, there, is a, there is a separation in terms of the United States, not yet here in the United Kingdom. Do you think that will happen going forward, or do you think it's, it's better to keep it integrated? So, so right now it's in exactly the right place in that it's the... In, in, the, in the UK, it's the Royal Air Force that's got many decades now of experience in space. So that's where the expertise resides. And, and we in this room will 
recognise that, uh, that, that link, that continuum of some of the ways we operate and think about command and control, think about threats, uh, recognise the ubiquity of space operations and air operations. There is that, that, that clear connectivity. I, 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 in, 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 in answering your question, I would say never say never. Um, and so you know, what might be you know, appropriate in 20 or you know, 10 years' time you know, might be a, uh, a standalone service, but I certainly don't see that for the foreseeable future. It's, um, it's working well. What, what I could add on that, uh, or this highlight is, uh, although the Space Force is a separate service, uh, we're still under one department of the Air Force, and we have a um, very symbiotic relationship because there's many things that uh, I do as the Air Force Chief that I depend on uh, Jay to uh, help support, and then our, our airmen and guardians work very close together uh, to provide that day-to-day uh, -to -day support. So it's maybe a separate service, but we're very closely linked, and I think that's the way we're going to be for an extended period of time. Okay, thank you very much. Anything to add? I, I agree with all that. I, I will say that um, what I have found since we've become an independent service underneath the department, uh, we clearly have accelerated our efforts in space. And I, I don't want to put words in the mouth of General Brown, but I think he would also say uh, that, that um, it has allowed the Air Force to, to focus more sharply on, on the other missions that they have, and that one plus one doesn't equal two in this case, it equals five or ten. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very great uh, and strong partnership between the two of us. Okay, thanks very much. Now, the question's come through on sustainability. If we look at the balance between operational capability and climate sustainability, how should Air Forces get the balance right? Yeah, and, that, and that, that, that's the nub of the question that we're wrestling with at the moment. And, and so when I talk about it taking decades, it is for exactly that reason. Clearly, uh, there, is, there is no way that we, we could become net zero immediately. Um, but I think it's something that we have to uh, collaborate on and share ideas. Uh, this will be innovation. It will be imagination. But for the reasons I said in my address, it, I, it, I, I think our... You know, our governments increasingly demand, demand it of us, our, our publics demand it of us. They certainly increasingly do in the United Kingdom. And actually, there was a conversation yesterday around the, the challenges of attracting and recruiting the talent we need as, as Air Forces. And, and in the UK, the young people joining the UK uh, want to be part of an organisation that takes this seriously. But it is as much about operational resilience in a, you know, the atmosphere will be different. Flying machines will behave more different. We will be facing more extreme climatic conditions. Our people will be asked to operate in more extreme climatic conditions. That is the operational resilience part of this, this, uh, this climate change initiative. But also moving beyond fossil fuels and think of all of the operational benefits of not having a, an enormous fuel supply chain that you're reliant on. You know, there, there, is, there are some, or, or, a, or, a, or a power source that you rely on. So there are some sound operational reasons for doing it, but contributing and playing our part, as we will be expected to, as certainly as we're expected to in the UK, um, to our own government's climate change um, initiative. You know, it, it's something that we've got to get on with now. And I've said it to a few, a few, a few. Uh, I've said it a few times. But when I talk to the, the sort of the sort of the leaders in in the Royal Air Force, you know, it won't be me delivering that, it's the people in the middle of the organisation now, the future leaders, who are going to be delivering it, so they need to be paying attention and thinking about it now. And that's why that uh, statement of intent is so important it is. today. Yeah, and that's and at its heart, and I'm probably, there's a, there's a whole panel discussion about this shortly, so I'm sorry if I'm stealing your sandwiches, Rich. Um, but uh, you know, the, uh, the, right now, it's about sharing ideas, and the work streams that are under, underway to share those ideas. Because no one hasn't, no one's got the magic solution to this yet, and and the more we share, the more we share good ideas and and g each other on. I think the, the you know the easier we will make it together. Okay, thanks very much, Sir Mike. Well, we have another question through. In the panel's view, have the required characteristics of new aviators and officers changed in the light of the global situation, advancements in technology, and the available pools of talent? What characteristics will our future personnel? require. Interesting, you touched on um, talent just then and that um, real aim for sustainability. But can I ask you, uh, General Brown Jr., do you think you are requiring changing talent pools and will do in the future? And are those talent pools available to you? 
I, I think it's kind of a double-sided coin. It's not only the you know, talent pool we're going to require, but it's the talent that exists and how do we attract that talent. Uh, I, I just think about how our, our young people learn differently um, today than when we grew up. And uh, there's approaches we're taking with our pilot training, for example, with our uh, undergraduate pilot training 2.5 with a different approach as far as uh, they're much more visual learn learners, hands-on learners, and how we adapt our programs. Uh, I, I think the other thing I, I would also offer that I talk about in terms of our Air Force is uh, we have specialties today that we may not have in the future, and there are specialties to, you know, that we're seeing today that we need to build upon. And an example I use is data, mm -hmm. data scientists. Yeah. So when I went to college, that was not a major. Probably didn't even exist, but there's probably somebody doing it. But now it's a complete field of study that's going to be so important. Uh, behavioral scientists uh, will be important, particularly if you're working in the information space. How do you influence behavior? And so those are the kinds of things that we've got to be thinking about of how we attract that into our service or work collaboratively with uh, others outside of the service in academia in think tanks to help us build that capability, not only just for our military, but just uh, for each of our nations as well. Yeah, I think one of the, 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 the greatest advantages that we've had since uh, establishing as independent services, our ability to attract folks. There's a lot of excitement around space. And it's a little different for us. We, we're a much smaller service. Uh, we only uh, assess about uh, 500 enlisted airmen a year, for example, enlisted guardians a year, and about 500 officers as well. Uh, we are having way more people knocking on our door than we can take. Uh, the, really what we see is the key development part uh, for us is this digital, this digital guardian. We are really going after digital talent. Uh, General Brown alluded to that, but that's uh, been kind of a core, and I'll tell you, it's what, when I go talk to universities and I go talk uh, to folks that are interested, that's the thing that really excites uh, the folks that want to come into our service. And a lot of the challenges that we face in this space domain are digital, big data types of challenges. Thanks very much, Jim. So I, 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 and I, I see it exactly the same as Jay and, and CQ. And I think the, the thing I would, I would add, and s some of the people from the Royal Air Force in the room will recognise and will have heard me say this before, but we, we have a tendency to, to recruit and train for the force we need today. And just trying to get our heads into what the force of 2020 will look like. The, the average return of service for a Royal Air Force officer is already over 20 years. For, uh, our, uh, for all ranks, it's about 16 years. So the people we're recruiting today, and bad maths I know, but about, you know, half of them will still be in service in 2040. So, that, so that's the force we need to be recruiting to, and it will be about data and digital, and it will be, um, you know, we, we, we probably won't need people to be able to, you know, that, that must pass a, you know, a physical fitness test. Um, you know, we, we can have different standards. We can look at different parts of the of society that we haven't uh, recruited from traditionally. But that is the nature of what a warfighter in the twenty in the twenty forties could be. So, so thinking of, as part of we, of our thinking about the technology of twenty forty, thinking through the demographics of the workforce that's going to be operating that technology. And then you have to start recruiting them today if you're going to keep them for 20 years. Okay, thank you. I've got another question which has come through. I want to use this opportunity to thank the British government for its military assistance to Nigeria. The need for operational integration has been emphasised in this conference. However, integration will be difficult as there are generational gaps in military equipment of partner countries. Are there plans to assist partner developing countries to upgrade their military equipment? Mr. Mike. Yeah, I, I absolutely recognise that challenge, and um, you know, it's some, it's, it's not an, it's not a new challenge, um, and and there are a number of different ways of of resolving it, um, but uh, but I still, I, and and it and it adds a, a, a friction to where we can partner and 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 train internationally, but I nevertheless nevertheless think it is working worth working through that uh, that friction. Our relationship with the Nigerian Air Force at the moment is in force protection and building up their, you know, their, their base security and resilience forces. And as um, you know, I, I, um, you know, I, I, the chief won't mind me saying, the, um, you know, the response that we've had from the Nigerian Air Force and the way that you know, that force has grown over the last couple of years has been uh, you know, a, a really impressive um, you know, bit of organisational development. 
And, um, yeah, and, and there is a mismatch in the equipment that's involved, but I think, I, I, I don't think that just a, you know, upgrade to equipment is sufficient, actually. The, it's the way that the way the Nigerian Air Force has, has approached it as a whole, you know, multi, multiple lines of development and, you know, that and building the, the organisational resilience is as important as having the, the most sort of cutting edge technology. Thank you. So the next question, has your analysis of the war in Ukraine led you to take any short term or medium term decisions in your own Air Force organisation? And what would be your single key takeaway lesson from this conflict? General Brown Jr., could you answer that one? Um, the importance of air superiority. I mean, that's why we exist as Air Forces. Um, and the, uh, how um, operating in a contested environment is something that uh, we probably have not done as much of. And that's the areas that we got to continue to focus and think about as, as, uh, as airmen, uh, how important air superiority is. Because uh, really for the United States Air Force in the course of the past 30 years, in the environments that we've uh, operated in, um, air superiority would, had been pretty easy. It will not be in the future. And, and that's something we got to focus on um, uh, as, as airmen and as in our Air Force in particular. General Raymond, what's your key takeaway? I would change one word uh, to General Brown's and, and say space superiority. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, all, of, all of the speakers have talked about it. Uh, Space has been very, very important in this conflict. We knew that. Uh, we've known that for years. It's, again, it's why we've, we've collectively taken the steps that we all have done to elevate space. But it's, this uh, conflict has shown the importance again. Air Chief Marshall? Control of the air, control of space, but not um, as in un, 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 uh, uninterrupted access to space is probably a, a, more, a more UK way of phrasing it. But, um, and then... Um, uninterrupted access to the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, though, you know, we have, in, in the battles we've been fighting, we haven't had to contest air dominance and we haven't had to contest electromagnetic spectrum dominance. And we can see both of those playing out and space playing out in Ukraine at the moment. And the, um, you know, there's sort of the brutal near stalemate that's, um, you know, that we're seeing playing out at the moment um, you know, is, is as a result of uh, a lack of control of the air, um, as was said yesterday. Um, yeah. There's another question that's come through in a similar vein. The RAF has for some time now been focused on defence through expeditionary operations. With growing visible threats in the world, should we be more concerned about the defence of the UK from direct attack, particularly from missiles and drones? Yes, and I, th I think I, and I, I did say as much in the... Um, in my remarks earlier, that, you know, that's actually a fundamental principle behind the future combat air system, behind the UK Ministry of Defence investing in ground-based air defence, but recognising that in, in, the UK, in a UK sense, we are part of a much bigger defensive organisation called NATO, and it's making sure that we contribute as much to the air and space defence of NATO as, as we do to our own homeland defence. Anything to add just before we end? No, um, homeland defense is uh, one of the top priorities in our national defense strategy, um, and it's something that we, uh, we continually think about because it's, it's threats continue to grow, not just from a missile threat. Uh, cyber uh, threat is a, uh, another cure that we're focused on, so it's, uh, it's very important to, I think, for all of our nations uh, to be uh, paying attention to our own homeland defense. Okay, well, thank you so much, Generals, Air Chief Marshall. I really appreciate uh, your time. It's been a really fascinating Q&A session. Yeah. And thank you very much uh, for your individual speeches. Thank Thanks, you. Susanna. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well done, guys.